Thank you. And thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, what I'm going to do t tonight really is to talk around um, the book that, that, that book, um, <laughs> that one there. <laughs> Seems like a long time since that was written. Um, and to, but really to say a little bit about um, my use of mass observation through that lens. Um, just a bit of, of, of context, really. I've, I've been working with mass observation pretty much all of my academic life, um, and certainly since I first came to Sussex in 1998. Um, and have used different parts of the archive. And one of the things I'm doing today is sort of talking a little bit about that how I've used um, both mid-20th century mass observation and done also um, the post-1981 mass observation project. Um, so the book, just to sort of set out what it is that I've tried to say in the book, um, basically it's a history of love across the 20th century, but really across the years 1920 to 1970. Um, the basic argument of the book um, is, I suppose, the argument that any historian will make of any um, particular topic, um, that love has a history, that it's meant different things to different people at different times and according to different contexts. Um, basically, that it's, love is something that historians should and need to look at. Um, in particular, I'm very interested in the period in, right in the middle of, of the 20th century. Um, I think that there is something interesting, and certainly the mass observation material um, that I've used tells an interesting story about a rise in expectations from love, um, that people expected more from love from each other, and also because this was a period when marriage was increasingly popular, that they increasingly expected more from marriage. Um, I'll talk tonight about particular mechanisms through which love was both found and experienced. I'll be talking a little bit about love at first sight, um, true love, notions of the soulmate. Um, and some of the questions that mid-20th century people in particular confronted when thinking about love. So what the correct relationship was, should be, between love, romance and passion. Um, and whether these things were actually compatible. Um, how to balance desire, agency and social obligation. Um, and what happened if love became so important in the making of lives to notions of lifelong commitment. And ultimately the book suggests, or the book doesn't, I suggest, in the book. <laughs> so it's not trying to disown it, maybe later. Um, <laughs> that, that basically, there's not this model, this, this, mo this model of love that emerges, that's quite distinctive, I think, within um, ordinary, everyday understandings of love in the mid-20th century, um, carried within it the seeds of its, its own destruction. Um, <laughs> but I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, so, to sources, and that's what I want to do in the first part of this talk, is to talk about my sources. Um, often when we think about love, um, we think that we need to look at poetry or philosophy, or, or certainly um, this was suggested to me um, by some people when I started doing this project, um, and that's fine, and that's good, and, um, you know... I'll leave that to um, students of poetry and philosophy. Um, but what I was interested in writing this book was to think about love in the round of everyday life. Um, and in particular, to get at, as far as, as, as one can, um, the experiences, feelings and self-representations of what are often called ordinary people, although obviously the, whole, the idea of, of, of ordinary people is, is interesting and needs unpicking. Um, I was also interested in the advice that, that people got about how they should live their lives, their love lives. Um, and so, I mean, as I say, later on I'm going to talk about mass observation in more detail, but um, I just wanted to set the mass observation material within a wider context of the sources that I've been looking at um, and sort of the sources that I've set in a relationship with mass observations 
life history and social investigative material. So one of the places I looked for evidence um, was um, the everyday expert. Um, I got quite obsessed at various points with everyday experts. Um, this basically means I just read a lot of problem pages in women's <laughs> magazines, um, which, as many of you will know, are compelling um, <laughs> and, and, and slightly repetitious as well. But but are kind of you know interesting changes over time can be discerned in them. Um, so I looked at. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I hope we have a signal for the next PowerPoint. Here we go, yes. Um, so, good old uh, Leonora, Leonora Ailes, who is just a lovely, interesting, fabulous woman, just a, a, an astonishing life. Um, and uh, she wrote for, for Woman's Own. She also did a short lived um, problem page in the Tribune during the war. Um, she also wrote advice books, including my favourite, which is um, <laughs> Unmarried but Happy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's also the slightly more racy Sex for the Engaged, which has a gorgeous, gorgeous cover, um, and is full of helpful tips. Um, but so, yeah, I was very interested in the kinds of the, the advice that they offer, because I think these everyday experts. Um, had quite a challenge. They were taking um, moral frameworks, which are very much of their moment, but because they were dealing with an audience, they had to adapt them. So you get this lovely sense of the edges, the edges of the norm, and how it actually becomes something that people that is practical, people can actually work with. Um, and I think often, even on the same page, they acknowledge both the importance of sticking to dominant norms and the difficulty of actually... Um, doing that um, and for me I suppose because I'm quite interested in the messiness of emotional life um, I like that idea of what happens when these norms actually are confronted with everyday experience what do people do that said Leonora and uh, Mary Grant and all of the other um, mid-century um, agony aunts and, and occasionally agony uncles um, were fairly uncompromising at one level in their advice. So a classic response would be, um, this is a reply offered to a, a young woman who was embroiled in an affair with a married man, um, quote, he is talking nonsense about divorcing her, stop seeing him. This was a woman who clearly felt that she was going to get something a little bit more giving. Um, <laughs> but it's quite, they, they don't always do that. Sometimes they have quite bizarre advice, like, um, you know... <laughs> Don't, don't tell your husband the baby's not his. He won't know unless you do. And it's like, oh, baby. So there's lots of interesting stuff in these responses around, um, around disclosure and, and the extent to which disclosure honesty is, should be part of a modern relationship. Um, one of the other things I quite like about thesis texts is that sometimes they publish, the whole issue is about the veracity of these letters, but um, sometimes they publish... Um, Objections by readers. And I think my favourite is this, which is uh, during the war, a woman's own reader who objected to this the frequent exhortations of married women who were told that if their husbands had erred, they should forgive them. And she writes, she says, I want to protest to you because you say that a wife whose husband has had an affair with a girl ought to forgive him and try to understand. I don't forgive my husband, and I hate the girl even more than I hate Hitler. <laughs> I consider it very wrong for you to talk like this and, and one of the things that actually comes out quite clearly in the mass observation material as well is the extent to which individual men and women challenge the birth and sometimes just ignore um, dominant norms and I think that's where this sort of more everyday source material is really useful to us um, because we get this sense of actually the, the, the practical ways in which people sometimes just slip under the radar you know, they're not contesting something overtly, they're just ignoring those rules and doing something slightly different, often quite quietly. Um, one of the other things I got quite interested in was, of course, um, ideas around desire, what people wanted. And what they wanted wasn't always what we might presume them to have wanted at any given time. Um, ideas about good and bad romantic catches are um, very historically specific, although there are always um, 
you know, those that sit outside of a particular norm. Um, where I looked for this kind of information, um, as well as within people's personal stories, sort of diaries and directed responses and mass observation, was in contact magazines and Lonely Hearts columns. Um, I got quite obsessed with the matrimonial post and fashionable marriage advertiser, um, which um, in 1930, for example, um, had an advert placed by a 27-year-old spinster um, who, um, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it out to you. She basically um, is fairly realistic in her expectations. She says... Um, Spinster, age 27, height 5 foot, RC, fair complexion, dark brown hair, in business, fond of music, quiet, daughter of a farmer, desires to meet clean, and if not good looking, at least pleasant man. <laughs> Five pounds per week. And, uh, you know, what we might see as sort of endearing in modest romantic aspirations were not unusual amongst people writing adverts, uh, submitting adverts to uh, the Post in the 20s and 30s, being a successful executor of a role, wife, uh, the husband, and very clearly gendered roles, um, was often seen to be more vital than looks or the capacity for passion. Another example, um, a five foot six inch tall widower felt it important to include his skill as a motor car driver pony and pig breeder <laughs> and experimental fruit grower <laughs> before self-describing as kind and cheery and not too ugly. You know, the Guardian soulmates today. Often there was a commitment to, dom to, to dom the domestic homeliness, um, steadiness. Um, it's quite nice, interesting stuff in this particular um, source about um, the valoration of a working class identity um, with um, spinsters and bachelors saying um, I want an ordinary decent working class um, person um, and I, you know, I, I think there's a lot more to be said about that and this idea of sort of the, the valorisation of the so called ordinary um, so we've got this sort of 1920s 1930s kind of practical headset and then we go into the post war and um, and, and the language in these adverts changes slightly, it shifts. Um, and we begin to see people asking for a soulmate, um, a more sort of introspective model of taste, which places some sense of, of emotional <coughs> connection um, at its heart. Um, and <coughs> increasingly this idea that, um, as we'll see in some of the MO texts in a minute, that love could be transformative of the self. And that actually it should be an expectation that it does that. Um, almost a sense of it's, that that's the right, that's where love should take you. Um, so, so, you know, advice literature, problem pages, but also the writings of experts such as Marriage Guidance Council, established uh, just prior to the war, um, and Lonely Hearts Collins. Um, but in the main, the core of, of what I've been doing with this project is based on, on the Mass Observation Archive, and that's what I now want to turn to. So, um, I'm not going to explain Mass Observation's history, because I think that would certainly drive more than one person insane, <laughs> and, and would be error strewn, and I would probably be deeply embarrassed. Um, as many of you know, Mass Observation, it, it's it, two manifestations, it's mid-century, you know, 1937 um, existence as a sort of a, a social investigative organisation um, and it's post-1981 um, reinvention um, as the Mass Observation Project. Um, for me, the, 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 the sort of glory of Mass Observation is that it's... Um, it, it's, it's, it's difficulty to ca the difficulty in characterising it, in pinning it down sometimes, it's eclectic approaches. Um, but throughout the work it did in social investigation and also the responses it demanded, it solicited from volunteer panellists through diaries and questionnaire responses, um, are patterns of intimacy 
I think it's, um, you know, mass observation was interested in ordinary everyday life. And ordinary everyday life is just driven with patterns of intimacy and relationships and, and, and desire um, and disappointment. Uh, and all of that is there. So when mass observations team of investigators went up to Bolton, Lancashire, of, of course they called it Worktown, uh, although first of all they called it North Town, um, in 1937 they were very interested in courtship behaviour. Um, and uh, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> this is pencil drawing, which I think is really beautiful. Um, was an illustration of a report, an observation on a pre-war dance um, where, as you can just see there, the, the writing, the people danced very close with the bent arm, which meant that the hands were near the heads of couples, and because there was not much room, it meant a great deal of shuffling. I really mm -hmm. like that, the, the sort of the closeness, the intimacy, but also that sense of, of being... Um, one historian, Eva Uwa, calls it islands of privacy. But the idea of the closeness of the co of the couple, but also the others, the people around them, that shuffling around them. Um, one of the Bolton researchers managed to combine a street pickup um, with a detailed survey of audience response to the film he watched on their date. Um, his report starts with a chance encounter. I passed the girl in Nosley Street. She looked at me hard, so I turned back and made her acquaintance. She must have walked very slowly, because she was only about three yards ahead of me. I asked her where she was going in the rain. Oh, just taking a stroll. I'm sure, probably not in that way. Um, then she suggested we, went, we might go to the pictures. She was about 20, dressed in a top hat and a brown tweed coat, round high heel shoes. So this mass observer, this person working for mass observation, and as much as anybody worked for mass observation, um, having made a connection with this um, young woman, um, proceeded to go to the embassy cinema um, with her, where the main feature was Every Night at Eight, um, featuring the song I'm in the Mood for Love. Um, and what I really like is that from just this one report, we get this beautiful kind of story that combines somebody trying to do their job, their observational work, um, somebody, but he also doesn't want to pass up the opportunity um, which is presented to him or which they collectively together create um, and there's a little bit of a tension in the report and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't forget that he's supposed to be doing some ethnographic work um, so we get, we get this sort of detailed audience response um, to each of the films shown um, he also, they, they were clearly at the time doing some work on um, capes um, and so he asks he engages this woman in, in some conversation about capes which um, were apparently no longer in fashion um, quote it's all raincoats and veils which are apparently still being worn um, but he also he records their physical interaction as well so you get this sort of here's my research work and then here's how our uh, intimacy proceeded and I won't read it out because it would make me blush um, <laughs> needless to say they are on the back row of the <laughs> cinema um, um, so of course as, as, as many of you know as well as doing this kind of observational work which continued right the way through um, and, and, and yeah, a lot of that work done during the war um, mass observation also accumulated diaries and responses to a regular questionnaire they called the directive and um, this method, the directive method of collecting, um, continues uh, today um, through the Mass Observation Project. Of course, there may be mass observers amongst us. Um, in 2001, um, I worked with Dorothy in the archive um, to put together um, a directive on courting and dating. Seems like a very long time ago now. Um, responses to which I used alongside the older material from the mid-century um, in this book um, so you know some contemporaneous some located historically located material from the then and some retrospective accounts of that period from the what was the now that actually now seems ages years long time god it's, it is ages 2001 where's that 13 years oh. yeah so um Put 
together, I think there is a sense of, of the Mass Observation Archive as one that is particularly um, well um, disposed to a history of, of not just love, but of feeling. Because in both Mass Observation projects since 81, and particularly after Dorothy um, took over um, the authorship of the, of the directors, that sort of permission that people were given to talk about their feelings. Um, and it's certainly though in the, in the mid 20th century mass observation questions as well in the, in the, in the, in the diary material that actually it's alright to talk about how you're feeling I mean mass observation in the mid century is constantly asking people for how do you feel about I mean, um, I've done some work on um, feelings about capital punishment we even ask people about their feelings about the death penalty um, as well as some really lovely um, material they generated on on happiness um, in in Bolton. Um, so they were interested in feeling, and they were, did ask specific questions about um, courting practices, about marriage, about love. One of my favourite directors from the archive um, was conducted in 1939, and they asked um, panelists to consider the role that social class played in their own romantic affairs. Um, and the, the answers to this are, are just lovely. Um, I married a girl of my own class, admitted a 28-year-old, and I think it would have needed a considerable passion to have led me to marry anyone from a different class. It's full of this sense of class as a marker of taste and, crucially, suitability. It's particularly suitability for a lifelong attachment. Um, one of my favourites is uh, a man from Hull, a working class clerk, uh, who says, I'm married to a girl of my own class. She was not the only girl with whom I was acquainted, naturally. And one girlfriend in particular was of the lower middle class. My friendship with this girl looked as though it might develop into something more, especially on her part. I realised that if we became more than friends and were married, that after the first infatuation had worn off and we came down to realities she would be unable to adapt herself to restricted circumstances without friction and unhappiness. Rather than take this risk, I cut off our friendship for the sake of both our happiness. Other experience and observation leads me to believe that as a general rule, married happiness can only be found by marrying in one's social class. Um, a, a perhaps more um, light-hearted response comes from um, an old and married woman who says... Uh, <laughs> clearly somewhat dissatisfied with her life, uh, her choices. She says, I would be more at home among wealthier surroundings. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Um, we are stuck through my husband, while poorer-brained women have forged ahead. <laughs> I want a fur coat and a villa and a cat and a maid. <laughs> not to like about her um, and th <laughs> yeah, so throughout the book sort of, so that's one of the directives I've used um, <laughs> I've also um, yeah, within the maths observation boxes which are obviously over there um, behind, behind the curtain so to speak um, every box has something, just about every box I'm not sure about dogs in war well, there's anything in, there probably is, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Natasha, you know, there is something, <laughs> some love in dogs in war. I suppose there's feeling, a lot of love, actually. Feelings, by the way, feelings about, during the war. Yeah, 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 good, okay, so every box <laughs> has something in. Um, I mean, this, this, this from, from one, one man talking about um, a visit to a new girlfriend's house for Sunday tea. Um, everyone would pretend to be jolly while putting you under the closest scrutiny. You wouldn't know what to say, and yet no banal word uttered or nervous gesture would get you off the hook. And these sort of odd pieces that come from different directive responses at different moments of somebody's life often. It's a lovely slicing of a sense of a developing life, um, written in real time, but often reflecting back on what's happened. Um, there's also, of course, and those of you who, who came to the talk by the Markinsons on diaries, um, and, and also came to, to Dorothy, uh, Dorothy's talk, talking about um, editing with uh, Naomi Mitchison, uh, know that one of the real strengths of mass observation as an archive are the diaries of individuals that are held here. 
Um, and again, there are particular diarists um, that I've used in, in the, I used in the book and um, follow through a little bit. I, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't describe myself as an expert diarist user. I sometimes get a little bit frustrated with diarists and the directives are sort of, they give you more. It's a little bit more, um, I suppose it's probably the laziness, <laughs> the laziness in me, you know, it's like, oh, let's get laser stuff. Um, but some, I mean, the, you know, that, so there are people who use diaries far better than I do. Um, but there are some that are so beautiful with them in, in the archive. Um, and, and I suppose the beauty is just in the delicacy of the expression um, of a love story, of the disappointments and also the, the delights of it. Um, and, and one of my favourites is, um, is this diarist, diarist number 5165. Um, a diarist uh, that I think Dorothy included in, um, in one of the uh, collections um, that you put together. Um, Know You'll probably recognise <laughs> recognise them. Um, but I just want to read you. It's, it's a fairly long one, but I think it's just, I mean, I su- because this is about my observation, I think it's to sort of just have, have the material. I think it's quite important. So this is um, Christmas. Um, talking about Christmas, 1940. Um, we had a quiet, happy Christmas. I came over to about eight o'clock, bathed and clean from head to foot. We prepared our Christmas dinner, the chicken and vegetables, and I cleaned the room out thoroughly. Then we had our meal and ate some pudding prepared with a special brandy sauce. It was really nice to be just two and happy without any cares or thoughts except of ourselves. Now, just to add a little explanation... Um, this is wartime. Um, this is somebody who um, has been conscripted, is coming back to the, to the home, um, to the marital home, um, for Christmas Day. When I came this morning, I spent some thrilling minutes searching for presents hidden all over the room. They were little things my darling had thought of for me, and I was so happy that I cried. Some gloves and slippers and handkerchiefs, two little favour books, modern poetry, and Huxley's essay on vulgarity in literature and even some razor blades, all wrapped up in special paper, with Red Father Christmases all over it in silver string. I gave my darling her breakfast in bed, and I sat beside her, opening my parcels and kissing her, because we were so happy and in love. We had a little walk in the afternoon, but the weather turned nasty, and we came back quickly and sat by the fire in each other's arms, and reading little poems out, or laughing at what Huxley said about vulgarity, it is so much what we think, and so little what all others think, that we laughed as we read it. When we had had tea and eaten more cakes than we should, we went to bed and spent two hours very close in each other's arms, and very warm. We got up at half past eight and washed, I shaved, cleaned my buttons, and caught the blast bus to the depot. When I kissed my darling goodnight, I felt I had never spent a happier Christmas. What I really like about this, <coughs> and sort of it's, it's just its beauty and the way it's put together, um, is the sense of the familiar festival but the extraordinary time. Um, and the, the precise detail, the detail which actually seems to magnify the sort of the feeling that's, that's being written. Um, and the feeling comes off the page, the sort of profound feeling, the self-consciously profound feeling of I felt I'd never spent a happier Christmas. Um, and the fact that, like many of the diaries, and particularly, I think, because mass observation diaries are so distinctive in the way they sit, the way in which this is both incredibly private, but also a public statement, um, a confession, but a public confession and an assertion of the significance of the personal and the private life at a time of significant national upheaval. Okay, so I'm just going to say a little bit more, really, about um, some of the sort of more love-based arguments of the book, really, Um, and um, sort of just to, um, I suppose, unravel some of what I think is is particularly um, significant about um, mid-20th century love. Um, So I've got a sense of, of... 
sort of the investment in love growing and, and expectations of love um, growing. Um, certainly um, novels, films, magazines of the period um, are offering lots of different models, lots of sort of romantic scripts for people, for everybody at a, at a you know, fundamental level. Um, this is a period that sees the emergence of very bespoke um, uh, publications dealing with romantic lives um, and also sexual practice. Um, click. <laughs> this, for example, um, this I love modern marriage. This is the magazine for the engaged girl and young wife. Um, <laughs> Launched in 1931 with a free string of Parisian pearls for its readers. Um, this is a, it's just full of lovely, lovely advice for people about, um, you know, all sorts of things. Lots of astrological guidance. Uh, there's, lots of, it's, there's lots of household guidance. There's guidance about you, you, what you should be asking for for your wedding. Um, what to do on the day, beauty tips, spray, apparently spray perfume in your hair. You must do that. Um... You know, there's still lots of this. Um, so there's this sense of, of romance that grows in this period um, that is fuelled by this sort of this, this, this sense of the things you can do to be romantic. Um, by the 50s, men are being drawn into that as well um, and advice is being given to them in, uh, in national newspapers. The Daily Mirror is very keen on making Britain's men more romantic <laughs> um, and is very concerned that, um, that they, they, they are found wanting, especially when compared to Italian men. Um, <laughs> so we've got this sense in the period of romance as significant. Um, there's also a sense of sexual attraction and chemistry increasingly more significant. Um, but I think there's also, and I've got quite interested in the sense of the power of love and the potential of love to change not just individuals but also society more widely. Um, and this, you know, this is this is there in the interwar. It's certainly there in the diaries of, uh, uh, sorry, not in the diaries, in, in the work of Naomi Mitchison um, and Dora Russell. Um, this idea that that love could have a revolutionary potential, um, but. Across my period, and particularly in the years after 1945, um, there's a sense that love can actually lay the foundations for better social um, order um, and can really help in reconstruction, the reconstruction of society, the reconstruction of families, that it also can be the glue that coheres families in the face of the sort of quite slightly scary um, sexual stuff that's also there and being valued but only in marriage um, about, you know, sex, marriage or sex before marriage and all um, so there's this sense of, um, sort of the significance of love um, within society more broadly and I think to take it back again to mass observation to individuals feelings about um, understandings and experiences of love we see these shifts in the status and meanings of love um, in, in the things that people actually write about their experiences. Um, one of the key distinctions for me in reading the material was between those who experienced, who reached maturity before the Second World War and those who reached maturity after the Second World War. Um, those who, who, who experienced, believed themselves to have experienced their first um, serious romantic commitment before the war um, often offer definitions of love which were accentuated respect um, and affection and downgraded attraction and passion. Whereas those who reached maturity after the war, particularly into the um, 50s and 60s, um, had a tendency to emphasise the physicality of love um, and this sort of existence of chemistry. And to give you an example of this from the Mass Observation Project, there's a woman born in 1936 um, who is writing in uh, 2001. And she says um, that she recalls the edgy excitement of meeting someone new, not being able to eat in front of them for the first time, wondering what sort of person they really were, talking about them too much to family and friends or indeed anyone who'd listen. Long phone calls, blushing. What is love? What a question. Love is overpowering sexual excitement in the beginning. 
and eventually respect, warmth, companionship, loyalty, and the all-embracing word of love covers all these aspects. To put it briefly, love is long-term, and in romantic terms, forever and ever. For this individual, love had a profound and overwhelming physiological, emotional, and cultural meaning. Um, it's forever and ever. Um, it, it's wildly ambitious. It's transformative. So this loading of love with new expectations, be they of a personal or of a state-sponsored political uh, nature, um, was tricky. It could, ask, could pose difficult questions. A sense that love has, it should be about romance, it should be about chemistry, it should be about transforming the self, um, was quite a capricious basis upon which to build long-term commitment. Because started to seek the tendency to seek outside of matrimony. Um, and because of this, particularly in the 40s and 50s, there's a very active debate in Britain about um, the nature of heterosexual love. Um, there's also a great debate about homosexual love, but um, in this book I focused on, on heterosexual love. Um, questions about the ease with which people fall in love whether love itself was something that was a unique experience or whether it was something that was repeatable. Whether you could love two people at the same time. Whether love was enough to create self-fulfillment. Whether love was more compelling than sex or sex was more compelling than love. And the relationship between those two is endlessly agonised about. Um, and what, what I, I, I sort of came to, to see really in that period is just this sense of constant debate and contestation about what the, what the nature of love was um, and what its status should be as something upon which to build um, individual lives. In particular, um, there was debate around two, two, two sort of principles, if you like. Um, true love and love at first sight. Um, within mass observation, love at first sight is used a lot as a device to explain um, a long-term relationship um, between, you know, amongst women as well as men. Um, in mass observation, and particularly in retrospective accounts of uh, mass observation generated in 2001, um, love at first sight um, is something that tends to be invoked by people who um, found what they believed to be um, their first serious love affair, often ending in marriage, in the 50s and 60s. Um, one man says, I think my wife had hooked me from the moment we first met. I remember seeing her home from the dance and then making my own way home, knowing that I had met someone special. In no time at all I was her slave. <laughs> My mother was not all that impressed. <laughs> a grown man, so moonstruck. About three weeks after we had met, we went out in the car one night, and she was so edgy. For a brief, despairing moment, I thought she wanted to call things off. But she hastened to reassure me that it was not so. Then the truth fell upon me like a ton of bricks. She felt the same way as I did. Um, of course, there were stories that were... I, met, I fell in love at first sight and it was the worst decision of my life so there's always this tension within romantic stories about the, um, the, the, roman, the, the romantic framing and, and the practicality and the balance between passion and, and, and pragmatism and whether the right balance was um, actually achieved at any given time um, love at first sight stories were often constructed um, love nonetheless as a once-in-a-lifetime phenomena, whether or not the relationship actually ended in, and developed in marriage. Ended, ended in marriage. <laughs> 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 um, and there is, again, in, in, in the mass observation of biographical writings, there uh, is a sense, many of the people who write about this time, um, that one perfect partner existed. Uh, there's certainly a lively debate in um, teen magazines of the period. Um, uh, uh, the, the magazine um, Boyfriend 
um, has a heated debate about whether there is one true love for everybody. They have one person who argues strongly that there is, and somebody else says, yeah, but actually, do you know what? There might be more than one. Boyfriend's <laughs> 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 brilliant. Um, one last observation. Uh, respondent says, I think I was about 18 when I had sex for the first time with my one and only love. I'm now married to someone else. Ooh. Brackets, see previous directive, full of pain and anguish. <laughs> and if I had my time again. And there's sort of, sort of obvious beauty about that self reflection, the sort of the, the care of the reflection and, and its significance. Um, everyday experts um, were really exercised about what happened if people rushed into marriage and failed to find their real, you know, the one. Um, one love expert called, uh, a guy called R. Edinburgh, I've been able to find out his first name. Um, he has this lovely, really brutal section in one of his advice pieces um, where he says, if a woman mistakes mere affection for love, um, quote, she might suffer greatly should her real partner come on the scene. There's also a sense of authenticity. How do you know? How do you know that it is real love? And this goes back to this whole thing about is it sex? Is it, is it passion? Is it sex? Is it love? Is it attraction? What is it at the heart of, of love? And one of the nice things about the 2001 directive was that we asked people <laughs> to, you know, what does love mean to you? Yeah. And just to kind of unpick that is really interesting. Um, there's also, um, of course, uh, a lot to be said about, um, which I, I think I'll, I'll stop shortly because I think I've talked long enough probably, but there's a lot to be said about the role of gender um, and the, the perception of the gendering of love in this period. Um, popular magazines of the period often presented male and female love as very, very different things. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the idea that um, the love of a girl or women um, is deep and permanent, whereas male love is shallow and <laughs> easily controlled and redirected. And you get this lovely messing up of a sense of, you know, this, this idea that, that there's often this idea that women are more innately emotional than men, but actually advice literature in the mid-century saying, no, it's men. They'll have the head turned just like that. You know, whereas women will be thinking more uh, pragmatically about relationships. I, I'm not commenting on that. This is just what the advice literature says. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about attraction and how, um, you know, it's women, women. This is sort of, uh, one of them um, uses this sort of old saying about sort of women. Women are attracted by what they hear, men by what they see. Um, and uh, it's women who are seen to often make the um, correct choice. Um, <laughs> There's, there's the air that women's, women's love is, is more robust because, quote, it is built on a more lasting basis. She doesn't love him primarily for his figure. Her attraction was more an attraction of mind. Uh, whereas the man's love is at first possibly no more than a body urge, but she can switch over to another girl if the first doesn't come up to expectations. <laughs> um, that's slide, thank you. Um, so I just sort of want to end now by just... Um, giving a sense of, I suppose, what I've been circling around here is the shift in, in expectations of love as expressed through some of, some of the mass observation sources and others. Um, and I think the most the striking thing that came out for me of the, the mass observation material um, was this increasing sense of emotional intimacy as something that was a key to happiness um, and this sort of extraordinary power that love could be invested in. Um, one must observer said in its highest form love transforms the individual true love should be the fulfilment of a person through association with another through somebody else others used a sort of religious imagery um, an ecstatic lifting up um, love represented as a transcendental experience um, this idea um, that love could indeed transform that said um, there are stories within the archive that suggest that this growing expectation, this promise that love in the mid-century supposedly offered, could sometimes be an empty promise. Um, one woman who married aged 19 in 1960 and divorced 
um, <coughs> years later, um, put this disappointment very clearly. In 1960, you knew you would marry sooner rather than later in church, have a baby after two years and live happily ever after. The script had already been written, down to the last stitch in the curtains in the women's weekly magazines. It had become possible for a woman to continue her full-time job after the wedding, and this created a false sense of equity. We would be different from our mothers, equal partners with economic and social independence. Marriage was a disappointment. An unimaginable curtailment of freedom. Not only freedom to do, but freedom to be. Obligations to in-laws, social functions, entertaining people you didn't like. <coughs> Accountability for everything. The impossibility of spontaneous action. And above all, differences between men and women. Husbands had rights and privileges. Wives had obligations and duties. And yet for others, this mid-century sense of the possible transformative nature of love. Um, was there one man uh, writing um, in 2001 said that his marriage, meeting his future wife, was the day my life became worth living. To me, being married to my darling wife has given my life meaning. Previously, it wouldn't have mattered to anyone if I was dead. And finally, this is a quote I want to, to end with. Um, this is a woman who was writing in 1990 um, about her marriage that she contracted when she was just 20 years old in 1950. She says, This September my hubby and I celebrate 40 years of married bliss. We both fell in love at the age of 16 when we met at our church fate. From then on, we hated to be apart and were determined to marry each other as soon as we were allowed to. When we were both 18, we asked my parents' permission to marry, but were told that we were too young. However, we became engaged and finally convinced my parents that we were in love and married with their consent when we were 20 years old. How did we know that we were in love? We only knew the longing when we were apart. To be together was all-consuming. Nothing could console our despair when army conscription caused us to part for two years, but we overcame all obstacles and here we are, 40 years on, and still very happy together. It must be love written in capital letters. And I think that, that this, and I think all the rest of the material in the Mass Observation Archive on love, intimacy, and also sexual um, relationships, um, the, sort of the, the real value for me as a, as a social historian of it is in getting at the ways in which people interpret through the individual lens um, some of the major shifts of the 20th century of the period through which they've lived and themselves theorise them very, in very clever ways thinking about how it makes sense why it makes sense, where they fit um, where their own experience is located both historically and also in relation to other people of their own generation their parents generation it's that self-conscious sense of of who you are, when you are, and why you are. And that's why I enjoy using this observation. <laughs>